confusing to me. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Then can I give it a try? Or not? Yeah. Yeah. Be stable. It is still disabled. So oh. mine is no. not. No. Mine is working. The is so mine is doing mine prog is not working. progressively. So. Okay. Okay. Because I prefer to test because every day I am in three different platforms, so I prefer that. I check it out, <laughs> but I don't lose time with it, but uh, it's okay. So we start, can you just uh, maybe repeat the running order? Yes. So it's Christina, okay. then Paola, then yeah. Claire, Tommaso, Adam, Francisco. Okay, excellent. In order of importance. <laughs> 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 In order of age, no. Let's <laughs> not go into that. Random order, probably is better. Okay. So, uh, have you seen, uh, Christina, any sign on your screen that you are authorized now to originate the slides? Adam? Ah, yes, no, I can. Okay. But then I have to go into this and then I do full. Okay. Wait. Okay. Does it now work? Yes, we see it now in the okay. room. Like this. Okay, let's say we only show, I think, these three slides. Yes, so I can okay. go for this. I, I, and then I, I, received, I received only three, so. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's it. I really don't overload the audience. Okay. Mm
more official. So we will start in two minutes. Okay, let's start. Thank you very much for being with us today for this session. Uh, I see many friends in the room. Uh, this is the town hall meeting. Um, the title is The War in Ukraine and the Disinformation War. It's been proposed by EDMO, that is European Digital Monitoring Observatory of the European Union and Eurovisioni. The idea behind this session uh, that we, why we proposed it is to analyze carefully uh, what is happening since 10 months already uh, in Ukraine, not only on the battlefront, this is not our matter here at the IGF, but on the virtual front. Um, an interesting exercise to understand how the internet could be used as a weapon, not only in the world theater, but also in, in the rest of Europe and in the world to fight the battle for the influence of public opinion. Um, this became a test bed for the recent measures of the European Union put in place to fight disinformation and misinformation, such as the code of practice that you know because it's been presented here in the past years, but has been renewed, and the network of national observatories with the members, within the member countries of which EDMO is the central hub. During this month, EDMO has deployed a task force of experts and fact-checkers to monitor and identify this information campaign uh, made by the forces involved in the conflict and their geographical spread around Europe and the rest of the world. An experience that, uh, from which we can, at the IGF, learn very much because it's a laboratory life size of what could happen in the future in cyber war beside the, the, the war on the battlefield. So we have with us today uh, a, pan a, s a certain number of panelists, all from Europe, because we are talking about Europe and European experience, but we ask to, to be reinforced by Roberto Zambrana <laughs> that is kindly here with me to support the session. And among the speakers, we have Christina Stump from the European Commission. I, I will ask them to introduce themselves one by one later when they will take the floor. Paula Gori, that is Secretary General of the EDMO, uh, Claire Wardle, that is uh, an academician, um, Tommaso Canetta and Adam Maternik, that are two fact-checkers, and then Francesco Shakitano, that is a regulator. Why this composition? You will understand later uh, following the course of the discussion, because these are all elements of the puzzle of how European Union tried to tackle this information. 
So without, uh, and there is Eric Lambert with us also that uh, is with us to stimulate the discussion. Um, without wasting more time, I will give the floor to Christina Stump because she can give you an overview of what the European Union is doing to counter disinformation in the, in the rest of the process of the regulation of the internet. Christina, the floor is yours, and you can try to start with the slide. Let's see if it works. Thank you very much. Um, I will take a moment to slide to start a presentation by maybe useful to uh, explain that I am the head of the European Commission that is in charge of the Commission's policy to fight disinformation. And it will be my pleasure to give you this overview of what the Commission is doing to fight information. This approach that the European Commission has devised is unique uh, by many. Uh, and why it is seen as unique is because of several elements. And I will give you this overview. So uh, first of all, in my perspective, it's important to say that the EU approach is based on a strong toolbox, a variety of tools, all rooted in the freedom of speech. And this can be seen in the Code of Practice on Disinformation. I will get to that. Uh, the EU approach is also uh, an approach that is uh, combining self-regulation or co-regulation with uh, regulation. So backing up uh, by a regulation, that means that if um, the code of practice on this information is not followed, then we have also a regulatory instrument behind uh, the Digital Services Act. Last but not least, the EU's approach is also rooted in a true multi-stakeholder approach, a multi-stakeholder approach that is both behind the code of practice and the society of signatories, to that I will get to it is also uh, very well demonstrated by uh, the approach taken by EDMO, the European Digital Media Observatory, and its hub, and the stakeholder community that it is assembling. Um, first, going into the code, did we find the magic bullet to fight this information? Now we put it in practice. That is not the case. That is not how I would see it. Uh, this complex problem actually requires complex solutions. So instead of one uh, to uh, fight this information, uh, the code of practice is basically how I would put it a tool, uh, a toolbox with a variety of instruments that all together uh, can be efficient in uh, fighting uh, this information. That I uh, will attempt to share my screen and hope uh, that it works. Does it work? Hopefully, yes. Um, maybe I have to put it on, uh, yeah, on. Do you see it in? Yes, yeah, it's full not screen. Full, okay. full screen yet. It's not full screen, huh? Um, so I will see if it works. No, it doesn't. No, for, for some reason that doesn't work. So, so I apologize for that. Huh? Maybe I go ahead instead of uh, okay. trying to fix uh, this because for some reason no, it no worked before. But we can, no, we can see so basically the, the, um, uh, this toolbox is uh, comprising a variety of instruments actually uh, consisting uh, in uh, demonetization, so um, tools to make sure that advertising is not supporting this information. This is achieved uh, by a variety of players that are involved in the sharing, uh, in the um, placing of, of advertisement. It also uh, uh, consists um, in um, uh, tools uh, of, to make, uh, make political advertising uh, more uh, transparent. It also um, consists in tools reducing manipulative behavior, so basically commitment by the signatories uh, to um, counter manipulative behavior, um, current and emerging forms like fake accounts, bot driven amplification, or all mal malicious deep fakes. We have all seen it uh, regarding Ukraine. Then uh, the code also uh, contains uh, uh, user empowerment tools, which give, in give more information uh, to the users uh, to identify, uh, flag, and react to this information. So basically, providing them with a context. And also, uh, this contains uh, tools to enhance media literacy or to have a safer design uh, of uh, online platforms. Also, um, the, the 
code contains unimportant uh, measures on uh, fact checking. This uh, is also important uh, regarding Edmos activity. So the code uh, contains commitments from the signatories from the big online platforms to have uh, fact checking coverage uh, throughout the EU and also to provide uh, fair financial contributions for uh, the fact checkers uh, to their work. Um, also, uh, last but not least, uh, the code contains um, commitments from the signatories to give better access to data to researchers in order to carry out their work. This is also uh, shown uh, by Edmos activities that also um, uh, aim uh, to facilitate access to data. Then uh, maybe just a very quick overview that the code uh, also comes with transparency measures, with a transparency center to make sure that users can consult how the signatories are living up to their commitments. It comes with a permanent task force that continues to work uh, on the implementation of the code and the code also has a robust monitoring framework to make sure that its commitments and measures are properly implemented. Then what I still wanted to uh, show you is actually uh, the multi-stakeholder approach that is uh, behind uh, the code, uh, notably uh, 35 signatories. This code is not just a, a code for the big online platforms, while it is of course key to have on board. Google, Meta, Microsoft, TikTok, Twitter, and um, their trade associations, but also smaller and specialized platforms are on board because this information is also spreading there. We have the advertising industry on board uh, that is important for the demonetization of uh, this information. We have fact checkers on board so that also um, uh, their needs are met. Uh, so the code and they can continue, uh, they can uh, help uh, to in the implementation, but also civil society, research organizations are, are on board and players that offer uh, technological solutions to fight uh, this information. I will stop my, pre my um, PowerPoint presentation here because in any event it didn't work out as I uh, wanted, but I think this gives you a good uh, overview about the code and the multi-stakeholder approach behind it. But happens if the code is not followed, then again, it's important to stress that we have still the digital services behind it that imposes risk mitigation obligations on um, the uh, very large online platforms. However, um, before I close, I, or, or, uh, I also wanted to quickly go into what uh, the code uh, brings uh, for um, the um, Ukraine-related situation and overall what is uh, uh, the approach of the EU on Ukraine. Here, uh, preempting some questions that often arise uh, regarding uh, sanctions imposed uh, on certain broadcasters, here it's important to say that this is a very uh, special situation when it comes to these propaganda channels. Here we are facing war propaganda. This is not the normal context of disinformation, and that's why the EU has take a, taken a targeted approach to limit the distribution of this channel in channels in a targeted manner that are a part of the Kremlin's uh, propaganda machine and that are actually part of actual hybrid warfare. So this is one element that is coming apart uh, from uh, the usual approach to um, fight this information, but this is only one element. It is coupled with the implementation of the code of practice where uh, we are working with the signatories to make sure that they live up to their commitments under the code, notably uh, to uh, demonetize uh, Ukraine-related uh, disinformation, to apply fact-checking properly to the, this type of content, and to apply to all the other measures, notably giving users uh, reliable information about uh, the situation to label, uh, for example, state-related uh, accounts, and also very importantly, to uh, take measures against uh, coordinated manipulated behavior that is also applied here. So this is the contribution of the code. And then um, last but not least, uh, please, also important to mention to the contribution the contribution of Edmo, uh, and this will lead indeed uh, to the next speakers that will go in depth, uh, but Edmo is contributing to this, but let's, let, let me say from the Commission's perspective that Edmo's contribution on this in particular, also through the, uh, to, through the Ukraine task force, is very important, so that's why I'm very much looking forward uh, to the contribution of the other speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christina. So, because you already made the presentation of uh, Paula, I give the floor immediately to Paula. Thank you. Paula. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much, Giacomo, and thank you very much, Cristina, for, for this bridge. Uh, indeed, Cristina was mentioning the importance to have a multidisciplinary and, and a multi-stakeholder approach when dealing, when dealing with this information. And this is why I wanted to briefly introduce what EDMO is, which was already mentioned. EDMO stands for European Digital Media Observatory, and the idea is to act as an independent platform that brings together the various stakeholders that in, uh, enhances a multidisciplinary approach, and it acts, if you want, as a body of facts evidence and tools. Uh, how do we do that? We offer, for example, trainings uh, uh, on the specific topics and various topics related to this information. We have on our website repositories with fact-checking articles, repositories with scientific uh, publications. Uh, we have a map of the media literacy initiatives that are implemented in the EU. We do uh, collect, and I will get back to the hubs uh, later on, uh, all these materials from the various member states, thanks to our hub. And uh, we uh, also, of course, organize workshops and events. So overall, the idea is to make sure that if you want to tackle this information, you have to first understand it. And given that, it, as it was mentioned, it actually touches on different disciplines and different stakeholders, we are there to bring them all together and to uh, make sure that we all have access to those in order then to have evidence-based policy approaches and to be in a position to, to study them. Um, I will skip that, but I wanted to start with just a few examples. One big achievement of EDMO is, as you might know, like when studying uh, this information, it is important to access the data of the online platforms because this gives you uh, a complete picture on how the disinformation campaign started, which are the actors behind and so on. And this is why EDMO established a working group that actually is um, as a, as a month that had as a month to understand how to access those data in full compliance with uh, data protection rules, because we know that these are, of course, also to be implemented. And we published the first of its kind in the world, actually, a report with a proposal of a code of conduct to, to make sure that this data can be accessed uh, in full compliance with GDPR. And we invite you to, to, to actually read this, this report on, on, on our website. Um, we do have a fact-checking network, and Tommaso will tell more later, um, that has uh, around 36 fact-checkers from the EU member states, and they collaborate together uh, on, a, on, a, on a secure platform. They do joint investigations. Uh, they they um, are in close contact, which also helps, for example, in the case of Ukraine, to um, share early warnings. Like, for example, some disinformation campaigns that were seen in some Eastern countries uh, were then arriving also some few days after in other countries. And thanks to this uh, um, network, actually, it was easier to detect uh, and also to be uh, alert. Um, I was mentioning before our hubs. So we have hubs actually from this week's in all member states. Uh, what they do, they detect and analyze these information campaigns at local level. You, you all know how important it is to have the language skills uh, uh, of a given country to do so, because of course, uh, this information spreads in different languages. Um, they organize media literacy activities at national or multinational level, and they are in constant dialogue and provide policy analysis uh, where to their uh, national regulatory authorities, and they do uh, uh, research. Uh, this is very important, and we couldn't be what we are without our hubs, because as I was mentioning before, they populate our repositories, and they enable actually the possibility to do, do cross um, cross-country analysis, to compare data, to uh, try to find common trends, both in research, in media literacy, and in general, to understand the trends of disinformation campaigns. Um, for uh, the war in Ukraine, what we did, and my colleagues afterwards will give you uh, additional details, on one side, we decided to have a database in which we, at the beginning, daily, now uh, in the recent days, not so daily, but very often we update this database with the fact-checking articles that are produced in the various member states. Um, this database has more than 2,000 uh, entries right now, and it looks at this information related to the war on both sides. And as you can see here in, in the image, there is a, the, the date of publication of the article, the, the country in which it is published, uh, the translation of the title in English, and then the link, of course, to the fact-checking article. Uh, thanks to this database, we were able also to produce weekly insights on the main narratives regarding the, the, the war and also some, some early warnings of, of what was coming up. Uh, in parallel to that, we started also the task force uh, uh, um, with some 
very important experts uh, to basically, uh, and Claire will give some more details on that, the aim was to uh, understand if we were ready to address uh, this information to, in case of emergency, if yes, what is working, if not, what is not working, and which would, would be the, the, the activities to implement to make this uh, working in, in, in case of another emergency. And uh, on top of that, the task force also, uh, some task force members published some uh, very important posts that, as you can see here, we just have some examples, but they are, uh, again, uh, covering this multidisciplinary approach to disinformation. So it goes from posts which show that there were some uh, Fact, fake fact-checking uh, websites that were actually uh, spreading this information to uh, a post on the importance of mental well-being of uh, investigators on the digital front line because as journalists and fact-checkers have to watch con constantly and often repeatedly um, some very shocking and, 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 and strong images, it is important also to help them, give them uh, uh, psychological support. Um, I will now give the floor to, to, to Claire. As you see, we, we, are, we are bridging very well from one speaker to the other, uh, because she will actually, she was actually a chair of the task force that I mentioned, which actually produced a, a, a report with 10 recommendations, which Claire will then uh, explain more in detail. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Paola. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with everybody. So um, my name is Claire Wardle, and I'm a professor at the School of Public Health at Brown University, but I've been researching disinformation for over a decade. And so um, basically at the end of February, early March, uh, Edmo decided to create a task force on disinformation in the war in Ukraine. And I chaired that task force. There were 18 members of the task force and we represented academia, journalism, civil society um, from 10 countries across the EU and everybody was acting in their personal capacity. And as Paula said, our job was to look at what was happening and respond so we as you just heard did regular roundups of fact checks mini research projects but really our weekly conversations were trying to think about what was working and what wasn't working and so in june we published a, a report with 10 recommendations and i do think we have to be uh, aware of what worked and what didn't so i think in many ways for the scale of the problem, even though for the last six years, there's been lots of money pumped into thinking about disinformation, lots of initiatives. One thing on the task force level that we were frustrated by were things like lack of coordination, that we didn't have a shared database. We still didn't necessarily have enough uh, language capacity to understand what was happening in many countries across the EU. And so in this report, we tried to say, you know, we're not pointing fingers, but we're saying this is not going to be the first information emergency. We've just come through COVID. Uh, you know, we're always going to have elections. We have to understand uh, what we can do better in a coordinated response. So we've heard about multi-stakeholder. We're, we're very good at talking the talk, but actually what does it mean when the rubber hits the road? And so some of our points that we made was that there, we were unprepared and there was inefficient coordination. And so moving forward, what does that look like? And Edmo is playing a really strong role, particularly with the hubs, of thinking about what that coordination looks like. Um, another piece of um, our work was around understanding literacy, information literacy interventions. And one of our members was Sonia Livingstone, who is an academic at the London School of Economics, who's an expert in this area. And she did, um, not comprehensive, but she did a piece of work to understand the kind of literacy interventions that popped up just after the invasion. And what she found that was that there were a number, but mostly it was about how to talk to young people about the war, as opposed to helping people understand the sorts of things that they were seeing online. So that was a very obvious uh, point, which was like, how can we be more coordinated? And in moments like this, stand up a kind of a shared curriculum and also evaluate that kind of curriculum in real time to understand um, you know, how we're, we're building resilience across the EU. Um, we also had issue around some, some examples of a lack of transparency um, around, for example, decisions to take down RT and Sputnik. Uh, lots of discussion <laughs> on the task force about that. Lots of pushback from some of our colleagues from countries like um, Bulgaria and Hungary saying, well, hang on, this is not just RT and Sputnik. So there was really interesting conversations there about making content moderation decisions, who's making them, 
where's the transparency around that? Not just from the platforms, but also from government entities. And overwhelmingly, we saw that there was a Western focus on so many of these responses, which meant that large proportions of the EU population were unsupported. And so there's a real obvious uh, point here around uh, developing more interventions, working with platforms around um, their language uh, ability. But certainly we saw in our task force members from kind of obviously UK, Germany, France, Spain, Italy, sometimes having slightly different experiences of what they were seeing online to our colleagues who were, were coming from countries that bordered Russia. Um, we also uh, found that whilst there was amazing fact checking going on, we wanted to think about how to elevate some of that to understand the narratives that were being shared and also the narratives that were being shared globally because whilst the EU response was great and to have so many member states working together was really strong, also we were saying, well, how can we connect this to the kind of information that's flowing in Ethiopia, the kind of information that's flowing in Brazil about the invasion? So there was a clear recognition that whilst the European response is important, it, we have to be do a better job of connecting globally around an event like this, which is a global event. Um, and so, and the other element we all talked about was the need for the full information ecosystem to be considered. So as Paula just explained, there is a need for more data from the platforms, but also we had lots of discussions about the role of broadcast media and print media in pushing certain false and misleading narratives and the challenge that fact checkers and others had in trying to make sense of what people were hearing from traditional media. So it's often very easy to think about what's circulating on the platforms without also thinking about the role of elites, whether they're politicians, whether they're religious leaders, uh, whether it's what people are seeing on television or on their newspaper or at the breakfast table. So there was lots of discussion about we need to do a much better job of understanding the full information ecosystem. And finally, we wanted to keep thinking longitudinally. So we finished this work in June, the war continues, and what we don't have good measures on is how the kind of interventions that we have started to put in place, what's working and what's not over time. And so I think a lot of what we saw was, yes, there were outright falsehoods, but a lot of the problematic content is what we call grey speech. It's not illegal, but it's many of us on this in this meeting would probably say it's leading to harm, but maybe over time it's a drip, 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 drip of low level grey speech. And what does that mean in terms of shaping narratives and the way that people perceive what's currently happening in Ukraine? So, again, lots of discussions about the need for more measures that can help look at harm longitudinally. So um, I'm not here to say, oh, it was all problems. But I do think we have a responsibility to say the platforms weren't ready for the invasion of Ukraine. They all spent that weekend deplatforming accounts, trying to figure out how to change their policies and it was very easy, I think, for us to say, oh, why weren't the platforms ready? And I think one of the major things that we took away from the task force was that we, civil society, governments, we weren't ready either. And it's on us to say, how can we do a better job to be more prepared? Uh, and I think that's that's why these kind of conversations continue to be so necessary. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Claire. Um, before to, we go to the next speakers that are the fact checkers that probably have the most interesting example to work on. Uh, I think that we need to make a point now because the three first intervention have been about policy, the first two about policy making, how the European Union tried to tackle this information. Um, and now Claire introduced a certain number of doubts and problems because when you start from principle then try to apply to reality, you face a lot of issues. So it seems that the way to build the Ministry of Truth or Truth is still uh, complicated and probably will not work very easily. Um, having said that, I think that the next speaker can uh, bring us concretely in the, in the field of what happened, uh, what this laboratory created by the EDMO has uh, showed up and I think that uh, is useful to, to listen to what he say. Uh, Tommaso of Pagella Politica, can you introduce yourself and uh, make your presentation? Absolutely. Hello, everyone. I am Tommaso Canetta, the coordinator 
of the uh, fact checking activities inside Admo. And uh, I'll try to share my screen. Can you see it? Okay, great. Uh, I am also the deputy director of Pagella Politica and Facta News, the two main Italian fact checking outlets, and also member of the board of the European Fact Checking Standard Network. So, uh, before I dive deeper specifically into the Ukraine uh, issue, uh, a few words about the Animus Fact Checking Network. So, it was established in the spring of 2021 and was operative by the summer of 2021. Right now, we have 36 fact checking organizations spread all over Europe, uh, the European Union, pardon, plus Norway. Uh, some of them are very big organizations like AFP or DPA and they have different bureaus in different countries, they operate in different languages. Other are very small organizations, maybe just three, four people organizations operating from small countries. So this is uh, the network and it was very important that it was established before the beginning of the war. So we were actually able to uh, <coughs> see the, the, the evolution of the disinformation in the making basically. So um, one of the instruments, one of the tools that we use to detect information, disinformation is uh, our uh, monthly briefs uh, in which we gather information through a questionnaire that has both qualitative and quantitative questions. This questionnaire um, is sent to the fact-checking organizations of the network. We gather all the answers. We analyze those answers centrally, and we, we are able to extract some interesting data. For example, um, from the quantitative, quantitative questions that we ask, we know how many fact-checking articles have been published during a said month, and how many of those articles were about a specific topic. So the first topic we focused on was the COVID-19 pandemic, the white line that you see here, later the Ukraine-related disinformation, and during the summer we started also analyzing specifically the climate change-related disinformation. As you can see for Ukraine, the disinformation basically exploded in March. So it, it, it exploded in honesty already uh, since the 24th of February. But in March it was like 60% of the total detected disinformation. Later, this percentage started dropping down constantly, uh, until October, when we actually detected this, uh, let's say, new rise of the uh, detected disinformation, specifically about Ukraine. Analyzing the qualitative question, that the questions that we, we, we ask the, um, the organizations of the network, we were able also, from the beginning, to isolate some of the narratives uh, that circulated specifically inside the European Union or in Ukraine. So you can see here, for example, that the Russian invasion of Ukraine uh, was actually justified. Uh, for example, there was false numbers about uh, the, the um, deaths of civilians in Donbas. Uh, false news uh, calumnying Vol Volodymyr Zelensky, the president of Ukraine. Uh, the fact that Ukrainians and Ukrainian forces are la largely Nazi. We detected also pro-Ukraine war propaganda, for example, the mythology of the ghost of Kiev. This is very important to stress. We are completely independent. We do not take orders from Central Admo and we do not take orders from the EU Commission or the states. So fact checkers operate in a truly independent way. And we detect this information as it is. We are absolutely neutral. We are not there, you know, looking for disinformation of this or that kind. So we detected, of course, a lot of pro Russia disinformation, but also some pro Ukraine disinformation. The two things are not comparable, but it's important, I think, to underline that uh, we see what we see. We see how it is. We do not invent anything. So other narratives were about uh, Western traditional media spreading false news or Ukrainian refugees being violent, et cetera, et cetera. Russophobic statements in European countries, et cetera. Uh, what I want to stress here that we talk about disinformation narratives when these messages are conveyed through false news. So for example, we know for sure that some Ukrainian soldiers had um, Nazi symbols of them, but creating a narrative about the Ukrainian forces being largely composed by Nazi, passed through many, many false content created with Photoshop, basically adding swastikas on Zelensky's t-shirt or on politician, Ukrainian politicians' shirts, etc. Or on the other side, during the partial mobilization of Russian troops, we know for sure that it was real that many, many young Russians were fleeing from Russia into other countries 
but we also detected false news exaggerating this phenomenon for example news about very long queues at the finnish border that in the end weren't true so this about uh, the the monthly briefs that are a very powerful tool for coordinating and detecting this information at european level also because the organizations usually have let's say a, a national business model so they they detect this information and counter this information at a national level so having a network that allows us to see this information and counter this information at the continental level at the european level was incredibly useful before with the pandemic and now, of course, with the war in Ukraine. Uh, the um, analysis of the narrative was so relevant that we decided to create this systemic contrast to Ukraine-related disinformation, thanks to the database that Paul, Paula already mentioned, that right now has 1,900 and more articles inside. Analyzing those articles, we were able to extract the main narratives conveyed by the disinformation and not only also to give some early warnings about the likely developments of the disinformation i think this is very very interesting because what we understood during the pandemic before and during the war after is that disinformation is an ancillary phenomenon to information in most of the cases so where the information goes the disinformation follows if the news are talking about i don't know the uh, for example uh, young Russians fleeing from Russia to avoid the mobilization, this information will likely talk about that. If information is talking about COVID-19 vaccines, this information will talk about that. If information is talking about Ukrainian refugees, this information will talk about that, etc., etc. So the third pillar, let's say, of our content published are these cooperative investigations. These cooperative investigations are produced by minimum two fact-checking organizations of the network, but usually, usually there are more, and they tackle a specific topic, a specific issue related to the disinformation. It was very, very useful to have those during the, the war, because since the beginning, we detected some very interesting phenomenon. Uh, for example, that the channels, the groups, the pages that spread until the 24th of February COVID-19 conspiracy theories immediately pivoted to pro-Russia hoaxes all over Europe. We detected this in Denmark, Spain, Austria, Poland, Italy, etc., etc., in many, many countries. And giving this information, I think it was very, very relevant uh, to the political level, but also to the readers, so they were already aware of this possibility. Another interesting case, another interesting example of a cooperative investigation is the one about Ukrainian refugees and how they were targeted by disinformation. Uh, of course, this article was first produced by uh, our colleagues from Eastern Europe, so from Poland, Hungary, Slovakia and Romania, that were the countries hit first by the big wave of Ukrainian refugees. And of course, the disinformation about refugees started there. But it was very important to create awareness in Western Europe too, because with the movement, the secondary movement of the refugees from Eastern Europe to Western Europe, so the disinformation moved as well. And so we were ready. But the flow went also in the other direction. For example, in Italy, Spain and Greece, we had a lot of disinformation during the period 2014-2019 about refugees and migrants arriving from Northern Africa in Southern Europe. And many narratives were very, very similar. So these refugees are violent, they are thieves, or on the other hand, national states from the European Union treats them better than what they do with their own citizens. So basically exploiting these cracks inside European societies. Uh, now, please let me leave the floor to my colleague from Demagogue that will talk more about the refugee situation because the, those guys from Demagogue, they did really an amazing job and I'm very curious to hear more details about that. Thank you so much. Okay, can I share my screen right now, Tomaso? Yep. Yes, please go ahead. You can. Okay. Tomaso, you have to... Yes, just a second. <laughs> I'm not finding the control done okay thanks Thank okay um is my screen visible to all of you yes we can see it adam can you introduce yourself okay yes of course uh, so my name is adam uh, um i've been professional fact checker since 2018 
And today, on behalf of the Demagog Association, the fact-checking organization in Poland, I'm privileged to depict the civil society's attitude towards tackling disinformation. So the mission of my organization since 2014 focuses on combat combating fake news, which is broadly spread on the internet. We believe that public debate should be grounded on facts. What is more, citizens should have the right to the unbiased informa information. So hence the question arises how it can be accomplished. So according to European and international standards, we propose a comprehensive approach based on two pillars. First of all, fact-checking, and on the other hand, media literacy education. So moving on. Generally speaking, uh, fact-checking is the process of verifying that all the facts in a piece of writing are correct or truth. Um, and it might be an individual activity, so each of us can verify information on your own, but um, um, fact-checking organizations have been set up across the world in recent years, and the MAGOC is one of them. Currently, there are approximately 400,000 400, fact-checking organizations. Uh, so what we are doing, uh, so since the war in Ukraine, since the war in Ukraine has broken out, we have verified a vast amount of uh, untruthful and misleading claims. Approximately, uh, as you can see, over 200. Of course, we have been struggling with uh, pro-Ukrainian and uh, pro-Ukrainian disinformation and pro-Russian disinformation. Uh, of course, the scale is different, but I would like to point out um, so um, I would like to also mention that we have uh, analyzed narratives which are common in the EU uh, and we uh, published reports um, with, with regards to Poland, Slovakia, Hang Hungary and Romania and so Tomata does mention so and uh, what we uh, what we have seen that uh, there are plenty of common narratives across the EU uh, not only in central uh, central Europe uh, but um, fact-checking is not an active attitude. It, mean, it means that probably the debunk article probably will not reach such a broad audience as in comparison with fake news. So how we can deal with that? Um, it's, it's not simple, but there is a solution called media literacy education. Uh, generally speaking, it's activity um, to promote to promote proactive attitudes in order to tackle uh, this information. Uh, so media literacy um, particularly involves um, how to discern truth from false, how to distinguish uh, fact and, uh, and opinion, um, how to balance so-called media, diet, and many, many more. Generally, we're trying to build a resilience. Uh, so media literacy education can be included in curriculum or uh, the media literacy lessons can be held by our uh, fact-checking organizations. Um, uh, unfortunately, mm, or fortunately, if you would like to mm, reach to the broader audience, um, we should educate as many, as many people as possible, regardless of their age. Uh, so there is one more solution, which is called pre-banking. So the pre-banking, um, is the idea that we like to um, create, I would say, cognitive antibodies to the future exposure against this information. So pre-banking is generally grounded on inocula inoculation theory. So it's like, like, a, like a during a real vaccination, we like to put effort into produce these um, antibodies in order to be prepared to the disinformation, uh, to the disinformation especially when it comes to the narratives. We, so we, would, we wouldn't like to learn people about uh, about uh, I'm sorry uh, I've, uh, I I uh, know it was wrong about narratives uh, about uh, techniques so how people can be manipulated because narratives may be different uh, so that's 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 the point and I would like to um, I'd like to uh, show you some case uh, some example so this year uh, the prebanking campaign has been launched in Poland. Uh, due to cooperation between the Magog, Google Jigsaw, and National Research Institute. And we have warned uh, Polish citizens against two common techniques, um, scapegoating and intimidation, used in order to spread um, uh, anti-Ukrainian narratives. 
And I, I believe that this campaign is quite successful because uh, it, um, it got 13 million views. So I, th I think that we will reap the rewards sooner or later. So um, all things considered, we should uh, bear in mind that um, packing this information is very difficult. However, it could be uh, successfully done. Uh, we should focus on raising awareness in order to promote proactive attitudes because prevention is better than cure. Mm, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Adam, um, for these interesting cases uh, that show us uh, again how complicated it is. And I remember that we are focusing mainly on uh, social media and internet, while the media regulation is already uh, has its own already established channels that is not uh, um, concerning the IGF, I would say. Um, it looks like a very Baroque architecture. Huh? Uh, I, I, I can see this impression because you have the European Union at the beginning that say measures, but these measures are not taken directly by the European Union. The European Union reserved the rights to enforce at a certain point with the Digital Service Act. But then the work is done, is commissioned by to, to independent authority. In this case, we have the, a combination of academia, because EDMO is a consortium of academia, and fact checkers. So third parties that are not within the institutions are people made of civil society dealing with that. And then we arrive to the last part of this puzzle of the um, tackling the issue of disinformation in the European construction, and this is the regulatory authorities. This is why we have with us, just was sure that meeting today, but he accepted kindly to extract himself for some minutes with us. Francesco, can you explain the role of the regulators in this? I, I promise I will do my best. First of all, thanks to you, Giacomo, and thanks for the, to the organizers, to, uh, to Paolo and to all the organizers of this uh, interesting meeting because uh, it is a very timely, um, this, this has been organized in a very timely manner. Uh, this is a moment in which really uh, all the rules are changing. We heard Christina before earlier explaining to us the code of practice on information and explaining to us also what type of interrelation there is between the code of practice on this information and, uh, um, and the DSA. And uh, we heard also from Paola what are the difficulties in, uh, in monitoring the compliance with the code of practice, monitoring the problems with the related to this information, and this is also very clear from the presentations of uh, all the friends who are doing the fact-checking um, activity. Um, now, uh, we are, uh, the regular, this is, you introduced us in the perfect manner, because uh, at the end of the day, the institutions which have uh, uh, the power to monitor the compliance with the general principles with freedom of information, but also with the free formation of the opinion, etc., in the various member states are the regulators of the individual sector. But said as it is, I mean, it would sound, everything would sound very simple. Uh, the regulators are the ones who have to monitor the compliance, they are the ones who enforce the provisions of the uh, of the various regulations, etc. But in reality, this is not at all that easy. Uh, I would like to start uh, uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, a report that was published very recently by Ofcom, just to give you an idea of the importance that uh, the news and the media online in the social media have, uh, have reached today. Uh, Ofcom says, it's a report that was published 10 days ago, I think, uh, Ofcom says that 60% of the British citizens look for news on internet mm -hmm. and 14 percent of the British citizens look only on the internet. Uh, Facebook has become the third most popular news provider in the UK after BBC and ITV, while for the teenagers the only uh, providers of news are Instagram, TikTok and media and all of the social media is becoming increasingly important. Um, also if compared with media, uh, also for the, for the uh, older generations. Uh, the citizens, uh, the citizens use digital interfaces 
in uh, for everything, for expressing their opinions, for reaching, getting opinion, etc. But in doing that, they are exposed to them, themselves, of course, to the risk of polarization and to the risk of disinformation. This is something that Christine has already explained to us very clearly. This is something that is also stated into the into stone or put carved into stone by this report of. Uh, now, against a, uh, a situation like the, of, uh, of this type, that is very similar to the situation that we have in many uh, European countries, um, we need to rethink the role of regulators for the very simple reason that most of the regulators in the European Union at the moment, until we had the Act, until we had the DSA, were lacking any type of competence. Uh, in, uh, in monitoring uh, the content that is disseminated by the social media. Of course, we could um, monitor the content of the media online, but they have to be media. So if we talk about social media, that's a completely different story. Um, in the unprecedented modernization of the rules that was this enormous effort that was carried out by the Commission and by the European institutions, um, they, this, the, this rule of modernizing the rules this, this, this effort, I mean, was carried out with regards to the audiovisual media sector, with, the, with regards to the copyright sector, to many sectors, but not specifically, uh, or better, giving us very few competencies and powers when it comes to um, online platforms. It is true that the new audiovisual media services directive gives us the power to uh, ensure that the measures that the platforms have adopted when it comes to protecting minors and uh, contrasting hate speech uh, um, uh, are enough or not. I mean, this is a power that we have, but this is a very limited power. It's, it is true that, that as well we have to check and comply, uh, to check the, 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 the compliance with Article 17 of the new copyright directive that says again that platforms should adopt measures in order to make sure that they do not. Um, or that they remove quickly uh, content that is in breach of copyright and this is again something that can be checked by the institutions not necessarily the regulators but it is also true that in the other areas this information in particular and this is what we are talking today the regulators have very little weapons some weapons arrived from the uh, code of practice on the information thanks to the european commission which uh, uh, gave us the role of monitoring the compliance uh, of the platforms with the obligations of the code. This is even clearer, I must say, and I must, I'm, I'm, I'm really very thankful to the European Commission for that in the new strengthened code of practice that Christina has uh, presented. Uh, and this is something that uh, uh, the regulators have done jointly, not singularly, because singularly we still do not have those powers at national level, but jointly in ERGA, together with EDMO. So we have, uh, starting from 2019, we have uh, carried out a monitoring activity of uh, the uh, obligations of the Code of Practice, and we published several reports that you can find in our website, um, uh, in the ERGA website. Uh, those reports are saying basically that uh, uh, the platforms are very active in trying to counter this information, but at the same time that the number of data that we are receiving from the platforms when uh, uh, we uh, try to monitor the compliance with obligations is extremely limited. So there are a lot of uh, areas in which the code of practice could be improved when we did the monitoring and a lot of areas in which it has actually been improved. Now it uh, it remains to be seen because we we have we we are part of the task force for the implementation of the code of practice together with Edmo, and we are working at the uh, service level and the, uh, the KPIs, uh, the, the indicators of uh, key performance. We are trying to come up with practical practical measures that would can uh, um, assess whether the obligations of the code of practice are being implemented are we being complied with or not but of course this is something that will happen next year when we will have the first new round of uh, um, monitoring of the of the of the um, of the compliance done by erga with the new strengthened code so at the moment we are in a situation in which we have new powers and we are going to use them in the meantime there is also another good news and the other good news is that those initiatives the Code of Practice and Disinformation, the other initiatives, uh, the DSA, etc., of the European Commission and the European institutions are being um, uh, joined, are, have been complemented by additional initiatives. I'm thinking of the regulation on political ads, I'm thinking of the various initiatives on media literacy. 
those are all, and I'm thinking, of course, also on the, uh, the EMFA, the European Media Freedom Act, which is, of course, something that relates to media, but it also targets, in general, the problem of, uh, uh, the problem of media integrity and the problem of the uh, correctness of the information that circulates um, also on the Internet. So, in order to conclude, uh, it is very early to say whether now we have a regulatory framework that gives us enough powers in order to uh, comply with our tasks, in order to um, uh, fulfill our tasks and proper, uh, um, carry out a proper monitoring of the compliance uh, uh, of the uh, platforms with their obligations of the code of practice and obligations of the of the regulation. But for sure, we are very optimistic. We are very optimistic because with the DSA that has been approved, that has been published 10 days ago, that this information has become one of the um, tools or one of the issues that has been uh, has to be um, checked in order to assess uh, the, uh, the, 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 the activities that the platforms are carrying out to mitigate the systemic risk. And so we are convinced that from now onwards, now that the DSA is in place and it, 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 validly, uh, it can validly uh, be combined with a code of practice and information and the other initiatives of the European legislators, from now on we will have additional tools in order to carry out our activity. Of course we will use a lot the cooperation with EDMO and with fact checkers and we hope that in the future this coalition of, uh, uh, of subjects will give us the opportunity of uh, um, controlling and monitoring correctly what the platforms are doing and uh, uh, countering the disinformation in a much more effective way than it, we were capable to do until now. Thank I hope you. I was clear, Giacomo, if there is any question on what we did, etc., I am very happy to answer. Thank you. Yes, I have one question. You said us that we were at a regulatory meeting, but looking at the noise that there is behind you looks like obstructions. <laughs> yes, there are, I, I had to leave the room in which there was a conference, and now I'm in another room in which uh, uh, they, are, they are doing some construction. So I apologize for that. So for fake news, this is really <laughs> fake news <laughs> from the beginning. Okay, apart from that, okay. uh, um, and, and the second message that I l listened from what you say is that uh, you are suggesting to the conflict, the party in conflict in Ukraine to wait until the legislation of the European Union will be ready so that we will be effect, really effective against uh, disinformation. But I am not sure that they will listen to us. Um, anyway, so I think that uh, would be, uh, we, we have very short time for discussion. Uh, there are some questions, uh, I think many, so we have to select <laughs> only few. Uh, let's start from who is in front, ladies first. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, interesting panel. And my name is Katerina, I am from Ukraine and I really appreciate the European Union effort in tackling this information. My question is uh, related to the like national hubs of the ADMO. As I understood that there is, for example, a national hub also in Hungary as a country that is supporting Russian propaganda. Have you encountered some additional challenges in this regard? Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Tim and I am from Russia. <laughs> that sounds promising, yeah. Uh, earlier today we have discussed some matters of fact-checking and fighting fakes from Russian side, and I have one question for the representatives of Edmo. And there was a story, a, a very sad story two weeks ago. Um, a rocket hit a Poland territory, sadly killing two Poland civilians. And there was an in investigation done, and the result of investigation was that that, that rocket was actually a uh, Ukrainian uh, air defense missile, sadly, but it was Ukrainian uh, missile. And regarding that, however, yeah. official Ukraine officials and Mr. Zelensky himself still insists that this rocket was Russian. So my question is that, in this way, does Ukrainian government and Mr. Zelensky are recognized 
as this information source and is that activity is recognized as disinformation narrative. Thank you so much. I, un I understand that your policy is to let few questions first. And, uh, yeah, I, actually my question is not so, uh, yes, my name is Piotr and uh, I run an intergovernmental organization dealing with satellite telecommunications based in Paris. Uh, European Telecommunication Satellite Organization. Hmm? Yeah. Um, actually, my question is not so much about uh, Ukraine and Russia per se, this conflict, but it's more of a general nature. Uh, and this is a question which I would like to address first to the, to the gentlemen who actually run fact-checking organizations, Mr. Materning and Mr. Mr. Kenneth. Oui. Uh, yes. Um, uh, my first question is, do you have internally policies that uh, would do self-assessment of your own work? Actually, if you go back to the, let's say, rulings or statements you made about other people's facts and uh, found out exposed that you are actually wrong, and then what you do about it. And the question uh, that follows up on that is, is there, and I really don't know an answer to this question, so it's not like, you know, I'm a, asking rhetorical yeah. question. Is there a mechanism, uh, a watchdog, that would actually conduct, I don't know, audits, assessments of the fact checkers? Because basically, as, as I see it, you know, and also as a former journalist and, uh, and, and a media manager, uh, we have a group of, uh, I'm sure, well, in, in uh, well-meaning, you know, people all, all over uh, the world, trying to check facts, but we don't know who those people really are, um, what they do, what, what are the um, procedures, what are the techniques, and uh, actually, uh, that would be, a, that could be uh, disinformation to the nth power if actually those organizations are infected. So that's my question about the possible audit procedures. So I think that we give the floor to the speakers to answer to these questions, and then if there is time, we will go ahead. So uh, to the first question about Ukraine-Hungary, I think this is for Paula about the network of the monitoring bodies across Europe. Yeah, and uh, yeah. So uh, the the hubs that that work with Edmo they have in their mandate, as we have at Edmo, to work independently. So uh, they are composed with by uh, a multidisciplinary uh, consortium where they have researchers, uh, fact checkers, experts in media literacy, and so on. And the work they do is supposed to be done independently. Um, there will be indeed a, a hub starting in Hungary as well, and of course we we uh, we we are pretty sure that the work they will be doing will be uh, independent as all the other hubs are, are, are doing. Um, regarding the second question, I think that Tommaso will also enter into that. What I can say more in general is that um, I think that case showed how, I mean, I would see that even in a broader picture in the sense that nowadays we also know, like in journalism, how much it is, it is a tendency to be there uh, uh, immediately. Uh, which has quite an impact on journalism in general. We saw it also in the last years, also with other news. Um, and I think that we, Tommaso can confirm because we have it also in our database, but this information, as it was said also before, is spreading also on traditional media. And um, and we saw, for example, at the very beginning of, of the war, there was actually an Italian broadcaster that was using images from a video game saying it was images from the war. So uh, unfortunately, this information still sp spreads on, on all media, but media uh, and journalists also have a rectification rule, and I think that as far as I saw in the media that I saw, this was then also also done. I mean, there was rectification of, of, of the information that was given. I would link that to, bridge that to Tommaso, who can continue on that and then reply to the last question. Yes, uh, thank you, Paola. Uh, absolutely. Traditional media, sadly, sometimes plays a role in spreading this information. Honestly, this um, cannot put the traditional media on the same level of platforms because uh, 
in general, if you look at the whole system, traditional media are still a reliable source and uh, platforms un are not editor. They don't have control over the content that uh, is published on the platform. So a lot of this information can flow over there. But I want to answer the, the two questions from, from the public. The first one from the Russian colleague. Uh, yeah, that um, um, statement from uh, President Zelensky was most likely false because we know that there are more than one investigations ongoing. So the fact-checking articles are saying the situation is developing. We have one side claiming this, that side claiming that. Something similar is going also about the North Stream uh, probably attack. The situation is yet not clear entirely. Let's make it the case that in the end, uh, it's absolutely true that it was um, a Ukrainian missile landed in Poland and Zelensky lied about this, maybe in good faith, maybe in bad faith, we don't know. Uh, this is a false news and of course we will publish articles about this specific false news, but it's, it's not a narrative because a narrative required a lot of false news conveying a specific message. So if in the next months we see many false statements, many false news coming from the Ukrainian side saying that um, Russia is hitting NATO countries trying to start World War III, of course that would be a disinformation narrative. A disinformation, of course, in the interest of Ukraine try to fear mongering NATO allies in, I don't know, giving more weapons, entering in directly in the war, etc., etc. This is, of course, a theoretical case. The, no, the other questions yeah, from... The other question oh, about the gentleman from Utah. Piotr, this is very, very important to us. Yes, we have a policy of honest correction. This is required by the International Code for Fact Checkers, the IFCN Code. And this is required also by the uh, recently born European Code for Fact Checkers, the European Fact Checking Standard Network Code. Both these codes require that fact checkers, when and if they publish wrong information, they commit mistakes, they say something false, they publish in the same article, republishing on the same channels, the same content, saying, okay, we are sorry, we published something that was wrong, this is their correct information. And in the uh, websites of the fact checking organizations, you will have a page with all the honest corrections done in the previous years. And more in general about the second question, who fact checked the fact checkers, who controlled the controllers? This is very important because anyone can self-appoint as a fact checking organization, but we want to have actual independent and professional fact checking organizations that are not, let's say, propaganda actors in disguise. So we have these codes, the IFCN code, which was from 2016, if I remember correctly, 15 maybe. And now this European code, the FCSN code, uh, that was signed in and approved in 2022. And these are not just codes that you sign and it's a deontology chart that you promise you will respect. These are codes that envision an assessment procedures with independent assessors that work about uh, controlling the applications that you respect criteria about financial transparency, organizational transparency, methodology, the honest corrections for policy, for example, is in, in, the, in the methodology sections, and ethical standards. So you need to have very, very transparent organizations, provide information, go under a very strict assessment, and at that point, you receive the badge of being an actual fact-checking organization. IFCN globally, EFCSN European wise. So I think we have some strong guarantees about the true nature of the fact checking organizations that are part of these international and European you, bodies. Um, I suggest you that if you can publish the link to the code of conduct that recently the fact checkers association has Absolutely. adopted, that this is a tool, an important tool. And I suggest you to have a look in the chat, there are other documents that are, could be interesting for you. Yeah. Roberto, sure, we have one question. Chat. Yeah, from uh, the online audience, from Amir uh, Mukaberi, from the Iranian Academy community. And the question is, what could be done in the situation that the global digital platforms don't want to cooperate with law enforcement in, order, in other countries regarding illegal content like enticement to violence, organized disinformation campaigns on their platforms? 
uh, what will be the responsibility of the respective states regarding their cross-border platforms, behaviors, and non-cooperation? Yes, thank you. I think that is a question for uh, the regulator. Francesco, you are still with us from the working side. Please go. I am still, I'm still with you, thank you. <laughs> and hope there will be less noise now. Um, that's a very interesting question uh, and the answer is uh, uh, not particularly easy is that uh, point is this um, uh, we have uh, pretty clear provisions that regard the concern or uh, as they apply to platforms when it comes to um, certain specific issues for example there is the European audiovisual media services directive in Articles 28 and 28b uh, prescribes uh, or uh, imposes onto the platforms the obligation to take measures in order to avoid that uh, uh, content that is harmful for minors or that it incites to hatred is disseminated in the platforms. This means that while it is clear that the platforms do not have a specific responsibility for the content that they disseminate, when there is a clear situation in which the content that they are disseminating is against minors, is harmful for minors, or is inciting to hatred, then when they get to know it, because there is a, uh, it's a trust or flagger that information, because there, there have been a number of complaints from the users that provide this information, etc., since they are obliged to provide moderation, content moderation, then in this case they have delete that content. So the problem of non-cooperation does not come from the moment in which the content is uploaded, because it's uploaded and the platforms do not have any obligation to monitor that content. But in the moment in which they get to know that that content is illegal, and in particular, as I said, for the audiovisual directive, audiovisual media service directive, it is against, uh, it is harmful for minors, or it is inciting to hatred, they have to remove it or to demote it. If they don't, then the member states in which these uh, activities take taken place, I mean the, the member states which have uh, uh, power over the platforms, can react with some clear uh, sanctions. I must say that this, is, uh, this, this, uh, this provision has been even reinforced by the Digital Services Act. This Digital Services Act is really the, the reason why I was saying before that this is a, a very, it's a very important moment because now that with this publication of the Digital Services Act, uh, we will have uh, all a new set of tools that we can use in order to ensure that there is compliance from the platforms. If they don't comply with the orders of the administrative institutions, according to Article 8, to remove illegal content, they can uh, be brought in front of the European Commission. The European Commission, with a specific provision, could come to a sanction, would come to a, a decision of sanctioning the platforms with a fine that can go up to 6% of the global turnover of the, the in the previous year. So if the platforms are not complying with the obligations of the DSA, including the obligations to remove illegal content, the sanction can be this one. And it's a very powerful sanction. Um, so as you can see, I mean, the measures are starting. Yes, yes. Um, Okay, I'm, I'm done. So this is this was the question. This was the answer anyway. Thank you. Very, very, very explicative ah. question. Uh, the answer to the question and very proper. Thank you. We have to close. I'm sorry with the others that want to raise questions online and uh, offline, but we have to give the floor to the next uh, panel. Uh, I think that we have learned something today. As you see, is a work in progress. I don't ask Roberto what he thinks from a non-European viewpoint. Looks, looks you something that is viable? No, I, just I only want to say that you remember that we had a, a meeting this morning uh, regarding this, a similar uh, subject but with a different version and I think in any case we, when we have a word, word and when we have interest in it, we will be expecting to, hit, to see these kind of things and if we can uh, not handle but we can see that one life, one valuable life is lost due to war then we can expect that these kind of things happen. So uh, the, the promising thing in the future for us as humanity will be that the things can be banished in a different way. And of course, 
this, uh, all this, this information matters will be also important to be as part of this agreement between countries. Right. That's With this Thank word you. of wisdom, we can close the session. Thank you, everybody, for the patience. And of course, Thank the you. slides will be, we will publish the slide on the website of the IGF. Very interesting session. Thank you. Thank you for your moderation and uh, all the best. Thank you. You're a debut, right? Yeah, yeah. We've met, yeah. It's been, uh, it's been a while, but. Uh, <laughs> I, I, well, I'm Yutosat IGO, not Yutosat, I say. Oversight with relations that we have over there. And obviously, uh, the company is uh, under criticism right now. So, yeah, yes. Yeah, so, uh, I'm, I'm under a launch. Are you still here tomorrow? I have put a sample here. So, what is the position like here? Look. <laughs> I'm the executive. Look, I'm the executive. Uh, I'm the executive. Recording in progress. Um, hi, IGF seven. Can you hear me? So, can you put, can you put Fang Zhang as the co-host? Oh, okay. Oh, I'm the, but I cannot change my name. I think it's fine. Oh. Hello, can you put Fang Zhang as co-host? And we also have two moderators. Uh, can you can you put a uh, moderator one also as our co-host as co-host and moderator one and two as we actually have three co-hosts here and also we have two interpreters hello hello yeah this is uh interpreter speaking but i'm afraid uh, i don't know why i cannot change my name into interpreters will you please set me up as interpreter at asap at vip.163.com thank you oh it starts with asap <laughs> Host Okay. 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 Okay.